All right. Hello, everyone. I'm going to pull this down so it's not right in front of my face. I'm going to take this off. Um, I'm Laurie McPhee. I'm the Associate Director of the Arts Research Center, and I want to welcome you all <laughs> to... That applause should be reserved for the beautiful souls that are in this room. I have to tell you, it has been such a gift to spend an entire year uh, watching them grow and hold space for each other and encourage each other. Um, I, I do want to um, thank you all for being here to support them and to support their voices. Um, the the 19, or excuse me, the 2020, 20, Oh, start over. Read, Lori. The 2021-22 Poetry in the Census Fellows um, will be reading tonight. Uh, they are Lindsay Choi, Ahmad Diab, Maria Kerr, Anastasia Lee, Giselle Medina, Jesse Nathan, Vincente Perez, and Damani Thomas. Um, Ahmad cannot be here today, uh, but he has beamed his voice in and will be reading to us uh, from his recording in the Middle East. Um, and all of the poets tonight will be reading work that they have composed during their year-long fellowship. Um, before going further, I want to acknowledge that the Arts Research Center uh, sits on the territory of Huchin, the ancestral and unceded land of the Choicheno speaking Ohlone peoples, specifically the Confederated Villages of List John. Every member of the UC Berkeley community has historically and continues to benefit from the use and occupation of this land. We, we acknowledge that the List John Ohlone peoples are alive and flourishing members of the Berkeley and broader Bay Area communities today. Moving beyond words, we encourage everyone who lives on stolen territory to pay a Shumi land tax, which we pay to the indigenous women-led Sogarete Trust toward the rematriation and sovereign stewardship of this land. Shumi means gift in Chochenyo, and we think of this as an obligation and a gesture of material commitment. Uh, this entire Poetry and the Census program is made possible by one foundation, and that is Engaging the Census Foundation. I want to say a major thanks to their chairperson. Oh, thank you, yes. And also do read, oh, goodness. Mm. I should actually just pull this down, but I will do that. Um, their chairperson, uh, Mona Abadir. Um, and I'd also, let's, yeah, round of applause. <laughs> Engaging the Census Foundation. How rare, how rare is it that a foundation comes seeking to support poets, and in such a large way that they will um, support them materially with, with a stipend, uh, $6,000 for a year. They will support them in a working group. Uh, they ask very little from them other than to write a blog post and do a, a recording and participate here. It is all about sending them off into the world, raising them up, being able to support them not only now, but in the future. Um, so I, I couldn't be more thrilled to, to have all of these people here. And again, a great thanks to Mona Abadir. Um, I'd also like to uh, thank my tireless and wonderful colleague, uh, Sophia Hussein. <laughs> Woo! Uh, ARC's uh, director, Julia Brian Wilson, who sadly could not be here tonight, but a round of applause for Julia. Um, and um, Berkeley AV for being here tonight, uh, as always. Um, this, thank you. Uh, the program is grounded in the relevance and urgency of lyrical making and storytelling in times of political crisis and the value of engaging the senses as an act of care, mindfulness, and resistance. We support poetry in its broadest definition, beyond English and comparative literature. Our now 24 poetry fellows have also had connections in African American studies, art practice, Berkeley Center for New Media, engineering and computer science, global urban humanities, music, Native American studies, Near Eastern studies, rhetoric, Spanish and Portuguese, theater, dance, and performance studies, and women and gender studies departments. And what that means, is that here at Berkeley, we have this amazing, diverse population that can do so many things. And they have their foot in multiple places, and they draw on that, and it feeds their poetic voice, which I feel like makes them even stronger. And so I feel like that is part of our goal here with that program, is to support kind of across the disciplines. Um, 
this, is, this program is modeled on the ARC Fellows Program and the core of the grant funds fellows to support their creative practice in these uniquely horizontal groups. So what we have here are undergraduate students, we have graduate students, we have faculty, and we have community poets. And they walk in the door and they check out of all of those and they become a cohort, which feels kind of like an amazing different thing. Oftentimes these kinds of fellowships are saved um, for just one level, let's say, of, of folks. So it's a non-hierarchical cohort um, and they have opportunities also to uh, participate with visiting writers. Last week, um, Jesse Nathan was part of the conversation with Tarfia Faizula and Vivi Francis and Matthew Olsman. The next day, they had a private craft talk with the three of them. And the reason I'm telling you all of this is that what I want to do is tell you that the fellowship is now open for the 2022-2023 year. Um, the programming next year will expand. It's going to revolve around issues related to indigeneity under the theme reclamation. This year it has been coexistence. Every year there's a theme. Um, we're thrilled to expand, to be able to um, go beyond Berkeley and the Bay Area to include a collaboration with the University of Hawaii at Manoa, Arizona State University, and the Nez Pierce Writers Group, Lukup Sheme. Uh, fellows will be chosen from each location and meet together on Zoom with an in-person gathering in spring 2023, gathering all 20-some of them together along with their facilitators, um, which will be really exciting. Uh, so I hope you tune in for that. Um, and our idea is to, to um, expand and create connections around indigenous issues across four Western states that will explore poetry and the politics of language in a wider framework. The interest is in creating a trans-indigenous conversation with juxtapositions that decenter European thought and begin to translate an ocean to desert to river to forest poetic imaginary. Uh, so the applications are open through June 4th. Please go to our website, artsstopberkeley.edu, uh, and you can find more inf information and apply. So to get on to our poets tonight, it has been one of the great privileges of my life to be able to run this program and to meet all of these individuals. Uh, I have met with them, with this cohort, every other week for a, an academic year. I've be, been able to watch their poetic voices grow. I've been able to watch them unfold. Um, it's hard to remember that when we began in August, uh, we were the first folks back since the pandemic. Right? What did it mean to even be in a room together? We had, they had to navigate that social strata. Um, and as well, they navigated Zoom meetings, hybrid meetings, masks, surges, and kept showing up. And they kept bringing the work, and they kept doing the work. Even if they didn't, couldn't bring it or couldn't voice it, it was still growing inside of them. I am in awe of the risks they took, their commitment and vulnerability, the way they supported each other and asked for more. It is not an easy task to bring fresh, brand new, fresh drafts uh, to the table and float them to your peers. On behalf of ARC, I want to thank each and every one of you. Uh, I'll always be one of your biggest fans, and we can't wait to see where you fly next. I'm going to introduce each reader, and then they will read for seven minutes or so. We will go alphabetically. No, we won't. We just change it up. I apologize. Um, uh, and we're going to start with Ahmad Diab. Um, and I'm going to introduce each reader. They're going to come up uh, in order. So we're going to start with Ahmad. And let me just escape here. No, not, not escaping. I'll just, I'll pull him up. Uh, Ahmad Diab is a Palestinian writer and academic. He is assistant professor of modern and Arabic literature and cinema, 20th and 21st centuries at UC Berkeley. His work contemplates the relationship between displacement and representation. He received his BA from Damascus University. He was awarded a PhD from the Department of Middle Eastern and Islamic Studies at NYU. He is currently finishing his first academic book titled Intimate Others, Representations of Arabs in the Palestinian Imaginary. He is also finishing his Arabic translation of After the Last Sky by Edward Said and compiling a volume of poetry provisionally titled Measures of Distance. So a large hand of applause for Ahmad. Hello. Um, sorry I'm unable to be physically there with you today. 
uh, as I'm uh, currently away on a research trip in the Middle East. I will be reading two poems. The first one is uh, At the Bicycle Shop. At the Bicycle Shop. The furthest I've ever gone on my bicycle was from Washington Square Park to our home in Hama. I was back to spinning cassette tapes around the pen. Like my father taught me. Like his life taught him. Like a dancer spins his rosary at the start of the Depke line. When I started recording English lessons from the radio, I learned that language can transport you. I also learned that the rewind motor was no match for my passion for capturing new ones over and over and over. It can break on you, you see, and then you stick a pen in and spin. Years later, I had learned, studied, and debated, sometimes even taught, tautologies, teleologies, ontologies. But one day, on the way to school, I had a flat. The hissing was louder than the egos in the hallways of an Ivy League university. At the bicycle shop, I learned that English can still mute you. A man with a respectable GRE score, a doctoral candidacy in the humanities, and a sincere passion for language and his bike can stand dumbfounded at the bicycle shop. Up until that day, spoke was the past tense of speak. Bolt came with lightning and saddles were exclusively for mounting animals. The second poem uh, is titled Anrua um, and I um, uh, wrote it in, inspired by uh, Defin def dictionary definitions. Anrua, noun, originally U N R W A P R N E, United Nations Relief and Works Agency, originally for Palestine refugees in the Near East. An awkward acronym coined together with an Alamo neologism to obsolete an ancient toponym. The first English word in the abyssidary of an Arab refugee. A consolation prize for the losers in the Liberation Olympics. An indemnity clause to shield they conquer from the dues of war. A set of privileges, immunities, exemptions, and facilities necessary for never returning home. An incubator for desoiled roots to grow in salty solutions. A heap of fish oil to improve the symptoms of statelessness. A can of powder milk to nourish the human matter flowing in the alleyways. A protracted camp to protect the city from the lava seeping from inside the tents. A bullet point on the resumes of future diplomats. A shooting range for aspiring fascists. An award opportunity 
for brash photographers, a field for the work of critical anthropologists, a white registration card to shelter our names from death and birth in neat tables and English spellings, a school wall for pissing competitions, for climbing over the syllabus, for drawing from memory, and for hiding first kisses. A cyan morning salute to all the people's flag fluttering to the anthem of our permanent effervescence. A mast to pin the children's wings to the board of makeshift history. A free notebook to journal on the annals of collective decomposition. A classroom to receive the inspector from Europe checking on the world's gift to us and on the length of our nails. Refugee teachers bought with hard currency to teach refugee students manners and how to be grateful that we lost a country but gained an agency. Thank you. Okay, can you see what I'm saying? Yeah. Uh, amazing, thank you, Ahmad. Um, I'm going to close this down, actually. And uh, next up will be Lindsay Choi. Uh, Lindsay is a poet and translator working between English, Korean, and Swedish. They are the author of Transverse from Future Poem 2021, currently shortlisted uh, as a finalist for the Lambda Literary Award. Woo! Uh, and as well as the chapbook, Matrices uh, from Spect Books. More of their work can be found in Omniverse, Asterix Journal, and elsewhere, including a forthcoming sound piece for uh, A Matter. They are a Kundaman Fellow and a PhD candidate in English Literature at UC Berkeley. With Noah Ross, they are a founding co-editor of the chapbook press, I'm going to say this wrong, M-O, parentheses O, O-N-I-O. Munayo. Visit them at lindsaychoi.com. I am so thrilled to bring up Lindsay Choi. So what I'm going to be playing, <laughs> what I'm going to be playing right now is um, an ongoing project of converting my first book, Transverse, into um, a sort of long-form sound project. Um, this is the first, uh, the first poem of the book called Phrase. Composer Steve Reich's Piano Face, 1967, marks Reich's first attempt to apply his facing technique to live performance. The piece is performed by two pianists who begin by playing identical lines of music, lines to be repeated in cycles for the remainder of the piece, perfectly in sync. Gradually, one pianist will begin to speed up, desynchronize, until the agent of desynchronization is playing exactly one note ahead of their counterpart. This gradual desynchronization is repeated for a full eight cycles. As the piece is considered process music, the process of desynchronization and its resultant discord, that which is not quite pleasing to the ear except in a vaguely intellectual sense, that which is pleasing in its recognizability as a vital part of the process which is the piece, is to be seen as delightful, constructive, aesthetic. To see the process itself as gen to release the aesthetic object from the role of presenting an aesthetic final product.
perhaps you understand why it is that certain words sound like the reference. For example, that liquids are those consonants such as the English L, which ripples, while others feel ever so subtly wrong, simply unapt even at a phonetic level, not crinkle, feather, or mulch, but water, verb, and, disappointingly, language. According to Steve Reich in Music as a Gradual Process, process music is not to be thought of as that which reveals the process of composition, but rather pieces of music that are literally processes. Parse, that as piano phase is not to be thought of as performance of the process of composition, the work is not performance art in the way that Marina Abramovich's work is performance art. The artist is not present. The burden of final aesthetic product, of which the aestheticization of process has released the process, is reshouldered. The aesthetic product is, after all, the piece, which presents rather than performs process. Parse. Composing process music is not a matter of revealing the process of composing, but a matter of composing a process. Obvious analogies arise. For example, with the aestheticization of growing discord desynchronization, piano phase models Lacan's I, Milton's Satan and Eve, Hegel's dialectic, all manners of political discord revolt and revolution. I recline in bed and listen to piano phase. I find myself sore and battered from the day's harvest of slights. I foster a pet analogy that the music mimes mismatching lexicons and constant amoebic process. After all, Synchronization not to be thought of as an act of engulfing. An interruption, a guest, an asset, kin. Everything I have read up to a certain point has hurt me. What had once left me reeling has become a matrix. I walk to the fields and collect my harvest. Now is a matter of finding the exact point and orientation of the hurt. What crop is left unreaped? What doesn't come through on the page is all of the screaming. Anne Boyer writes in Garments Against Women, a friend who has a job as a telephone transcriptionist for people who can't hear has had to face the problem of what to do when one party he is transcribing has sobbed. I face a similar problem, except I'm always, just constantly, screaming, and there's absolutely no way to get it on the page unless I superimpose a large scream over the entirety of each page, which of course has complications thanks to the infinite scroll capabilities of web pages. I simply don't have an infinite scream. Is the obvious analogy with music, and Hygienian in my life recounts childhood with such tenderness. I foster a pet project, I string the garden, pull a thread through the representative leaf of each plant. This, too, is a balm. To understand why it is that certain common sayings are perhaps necessarily untruthful, though not necessarily lies, the most common offender being, I'm not just saying this, you are doing exactly that. To quote Lin Shu's debts and lessons, I am not asking you to die for me, they you will die for me. To observe how certain acts of speech work to silence others, a point which Ray Langton argues in her article Speech Acts and Unspeakable Acts. 
In her effort to decry rape and pornography, pornography as rape, pornographic rape, the speech act of rape, Langton works through her argument with such philosophical rigor. I see a position which, at its core, despite its extreme eloquence, only negatively inscribes how it is that silence feels like its visual metaphor, spectral or non-existent, as some silences have no visual presence, which is not to say no body. See a stranger and see a reflection, a fantasy of his fantasy of raping. Desire itself desirable. To desire desire. To desire the desire. The desire desire to desire. Desire desire to desire. The desire desire to desire. Desire to. certain people are looking at me, or that certain people aren't. I'd have to add other words to more correctly describe the emotion. Scream. Desire. Scream. Shyness. Scream. Screaming. At this time, 6.15pm PST, 17 April 2016, Steve Reich subscribes on Twitter as America's greatest living composer. Ellipses, Village Voice, Ellipses, the most original musical thinker of our time, The New Yorker. Page run by at Boozy underscore New York. You may visit his website at www.stevereich.com. Thanks, Lindsay. It's been amazing to watch that piece grow. They have brought it in um, at least once or uh, twice, two other times. Um, I love it every time. I can't wait to hear the entire book uh, set that way. Our next speaker is going to be, reader is going to be Damani Thomas. Damani is a writer from Oakland, California, occupied Ohlone territory. He has received fellowships from The Watering Hole, Fog Lifter, Literary Journal, Afro-Urban Society and UC Berkeley's Arts uh, Research Center. His work can be found in the Auburn Avenue, the Shade Journal, the Anna, and elsewhere. His poem, Survival Tactics, was shortlisted for the 2020 Penrose Poetry Prize. In 2021, they were nominated for a Best New Poets and Best of the Net Award. In their free time, catch them watching horror movies, dancing, or craving fries. Please welcome Damani Thomas. Hi, everyone. Uh, so first and foremost, thank you for being present um, and thank you for listening. Um, listening is hard. Uh, but yeah, before we start, I have three poems for y'all. 
But I come from like a slam background. So uh, a lot of ways that um, I like to interact with people is through like audible noise. So we can do things like snapping. If you hear something you like, uh, you can do like an mmm noise, like, you know, uh, good food. Um, you can clap, you can say like, go in. Uh, you can Venmo, you know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> yeah, so uh, you can, don't be nice, you know what I'm saying? Um, so yeah, we're just gonna jump into it. Um, <laughs> word, okay, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'm gonna pull out my photo of it, we'll see. Um, so this first poem is, uh, is after a friend of mine in Toronto, Canada, uh, Melissa Davidson. This is called uh, Remedies for Almost Coastal Dispersion. Salt water for sore throat, honey hall and ginger tea slow dance, chicken noodle and orange and lemon, Louisiana hurricane says call every hour and play. Grandma made it out the south, her almost coast, counting natural disasters as inheritance now counts cars passing in East Oakland for hobby and conversation material. Material meaning substance, meaning matter rather than form, or occasionally she has night terrors. And I want to ask what's the matter, but smell rotten teeth as her knee replacement limps by. Fried okra and red beans and red Kool-Aid for longevity. I worry we lost our culture when we traded coasts. I worry we lose each other when we preserve culture. Out south we say, Mosquitoes love black people here, like governments love prisons. A toothless half smile means sure. An empty plate means good. For any emotion killable, take long drives to songs from the 80s. For heartbreak, double scoop butter pecan. For fear of poverty, work to your 70. For black moms afraid of losing sons, make sure you make it home. Her sophomore year, my mother saved my grandmother with her tuition. My sophomore year, my mother told me about her cancer and then told me not to worry. The curse of a black mom is generational poetry. To stop a flood, secure the levees. To stop a tear, hug the heart. We worried about our family, friends, and the chaos, and now only have a singular that calls. I trace black pepper back to India. I trace salt to a kidney. A medical diagnosis caused death by seasoning American history. I learned to measure with the eye. A tablespoon of anything looks like a baby finger held in the palm. A mountain we can't cross in a rented vehicle. Latchkey kids were most unsafe during the era of white van disappearances. Coke blades hidden in Snickers. After school meals were lemon pepper chicken breast, rosemary, creole mix, a diversity catalog of vegetables. Anything to make cold meals like burying the dead colorful. In Oakland, our living room makes California small. Three generations of black women talk about almost marriages. Raise children in the company of each other. For fleas, eucalyptus alters the door. Sunscreen alters skin. Custody battles distance kin. Sprite and saltine marathons for anything nausea. Hot shower and Vicks the coat chest. Top ramen by the bowl food. Dilute sodium packet with nostalgia. At the funeral I learn, a good meal can cure anything. Mosquito bites, homesickness, even loss. Uh, so this, uh, so I'm working on this project around like surveillance and intimacy, and um, this next poem, um, I think it's like a very real thing that like sometimes people just like go missing and people pretend like it like we don't know what happened to them, um, and so I was thinking about the idea of like the narrator of this project, the narrator of this project like going missing and um, asking to be found. Uh, so this is called uh, Black Morse. If you are reading this, I have lost myself. The same way prison suicide unknowingly are the same way police reproduce like cockroaches. At this rate, I believe the only things left after the world ends will be borders. A violence so indigenous will forget what its name was and a people whose job requires calling things objects instead of what they actually are. But I have a selfish request. I need you to find me. Do not conjure what the waters washed away. Find me in Louisiana blues. Find me in my Mardi Gras best. Find me 
on MacArthur or East 14th or Bancroft intersection whenever the sideshow smoke towers. Find me, and the one time Stephen threatened to feed me a dead mosquito, find me, find me, promise you'll look for me and Piccadilly and red beans find me waving a white flag after another politician promises another policy named after a weapon of war. Find me, find me well-versed in contradiction. Find my joys and give them back. My mango Jumex, my dollar Arizona, my late night car ride, shower time length of a sad pop song, microaggression side eye the way black folks know, knuck if you buck before the beat drops, that high pitched scream, before that full gut laugh, my grandmother's pork and beans, my mother's Cinnabons, my grandmother's black eyed peas, my grandmother, my mother, give them back. My body may decay, but I promise my spirit will kill whoever did this. Uh, so this is my, my last poem for you all. Um, again, thank you for listening. Uh, this was actually supposed to be the poem I turned in on our meeting this Monday, uh, but I was just like thinking a lot about it. Uh, so this is called Voicemail. <clears throat> also, I have no idea where it's going, so. Uh, voicemail. Girl, if roses go from concrete, then why every apocalypse take place in the hood? And if we care about poor people, then what is trickle down economics? Mind you, the life is like a box of chocolate simile and love me not petals don't even like each other. Freedom has been a purchasable item since a man first asked a woman if she loved him and didn't take no as an answer. Mind you, Jim Crow thinks Kanye was the gold digger in all of his relationships and the sky is blue as long as poets say so. Now look at that, <laughs> now look at that. I declare the sky orange. The sky was a shade of fire and Amazon raised humidifier prices and the government would outlaw love songs if we made them protest songs. A police precinct charged to Whitney Houston's I Will Always Love You. And somewhere, remnants of a baton become soot stuck in a child's throat. Mind you, the earliest mention of difficulty breathing is BC. Pollen can take the breath away. What can splitting the sea do? Jesus was a carpenter. Tupac was a backup dancer. I believe in reincarnation. Obama ran on a change platform and then killed the same brown people. Now look at us, holding tight to democracy, all clown face and red handed. Mind you, red is either extracted from crushed gemstones or beetles in Mexico or some chemical process I don't understand, but girl, <laughs> my grandma told your grandma that your second cousin once removed heard from his friend who just so happens to know the guy who was the subject of Frank Ocean's thinking about you. You know, you know that guy, mind you, for years, we changed the pronoun of a love song, stripped the car bare and rolled metal sparks. I'm sorry, Mr. Ocean. I was looking elsewhere during your magic trick. I was busy pulling bombs out of a children's story. I was busy crafting, crafting a myth where people of color storm the Capitol and make it out alive. I was where people of color enter a melting pot and make it out alive, where people of color make it out alive, but that's no excuse. I think I've said too much about fear. Why else leave a three minute voicemail? With everything going on in the world, what if you never call me back? Thank you. <laughs> He'll be sharing the Venmo <laughs> at the end. Thank you so much, Damani. Uh, God, so much joy listening to all, all y'all. Um, next up is going to be Vincente Perez. Vincente, he, they, is a black Mexican-American performance poet, scholar, and writer working at the intersections of poetry, hip hop, and digital black cultural praxis when it, with an interest in the way that artists use narrative to resist dominant stories that attempt to erase, subjugate, or enact violence on marginalized communities. Their work centers blacks, black and Latinx lived experience with a stylistic approach that samples and remixes hip hop and performance poetry into counter narratives. He is a PhD candidate in the Performance Studies Program, Department of Theater, Dance and Performance Studies. Please give it up for Vincente. Goddamn. 
I'm like sitting there writing after this. We got to talk later. Thank you so much, everyone. It's been just wonderful to be here, especially in this working group. Um, I'm going to do something small, and then we're going to get right into the poems. Um, I'm going to say something. You're going to repeat it back. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Say, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Say, woo, woo. Say, woo, woo. woo, woo. Exactly. Does that feel good? Yeah. It feels good. It feels so good to be with people in this space in bodily form. This first poem is Fumbling. Sometimes we fumble forward and call it life. One time when I was dancing, a coroner asked me if I realized I was dead. I remember that and laugh. Funny to think I was running before the stumble that birthed mankind. Maybe I did dance before I crawled. Maybe I did crash before I stalled back to the future. To me, there ain't really such a thing until all my niggas free to call themselves by their own names. See, the human is dead. Life is sacred. This audacious end cannot be. The precedent is you. Tell me, if you are taken and then die, where does the body linger? I felt life first in a praise song to my own death. I just started singing, free me from humanity. I served a dream that did not serve me. The mirror never returns a familiar image when you are time infracted, always heading home, never having arrived. Thank you. A lot of, a lot of my work uh, comes from my manuscript titled uh, Narrating Otherwise, where I'm trying to write outside of the dictates of white supremacist conceptions of value. Um, so I don't think the human is actually a, an ideal to go for. Um, our topic for this year as a working group was coexistence, and I actually struggle with the term. Um, I don't want to coexist with people or systems that want me dead, and the human is one of those systems. Vox. I said I don't want to be a human even if that means being dead. Even if that means I'll never be sane, never be considered capable of complex thinking, I want to be mad. I want to smelt every silver-lined compromise into a weapon. They hand me perspective, and I want to make the double edge sharp and apparent. My hand is bleeding, and I want, them, I want to hand them back death. Anger is not a secondary emotion when you're never considered capable of the original sin. I want to order my feelings and myself differently. Maybe I am the chicken and the egg, the voice that truly echoes in the forest whether a white person is around to confirm its truth or not. What if I'm meant to be less composed and more arranged, less ordered with more orderlies? I've been sounding off since the ass smack, the strike that confirmed my life. I want to take my cry back. It was for me, my first attempt at letting the world know the weight of my expected silence. It was my truth and mine alone. Quantum, one, time starts and people grow undisturbed until history begins. Civilizations are rendered relics and though they denounce magic, these people learn to control time. Two, with the clock started, these people trust that their God made the world in seven days, decided to treat new lands like the world God made, never called it blasphemy, only destiny manifested through divine right. Three, God made Eve via Adam's rib. As these people blossom, they baptize with blood and flesh every chance they could. It's better to give than to receive. Violence begets violence. The birthright of freedom must be earned here. Four, stories become stored in words. Marooned, puzzled pieces being put together feels like 52 card pickup. Was I king or queen when I was jacked? Five, Annie up. Poker faces greet me, house wins again, jokers are treated like aces up sleeves, house rules are domain, we, are, we remain hidden in the plane, cash out or get cashed in. Six, the story continues to be written in reverse, correction fluid at the ready, with stop gap in stops, America writes for itself, stop. This is America, this is her story, history. This is America, this is history. This is a story, time is history, America erases history. This is her story, mercy me, is America. Sorry. Is there time for one more? This is um, On Reaching Out, and I have two short ones, so I might be able to do two. On Reaching Out. Sometimes when I say I'm low capacity, what I really mean is a word I can't say because then the cops come. 
I keep hearing I should reach out when I feel like this, but sometimes phone calls catch bodies. A sick telephone game, I said I feel like I'm willing to talk, but a gun answered. A receptionist led a front desk funeral. The uniform changed, the job didn't. I admit sometimes I take the pill and sometimes it goes down fine, but too many times I couldn't say what was on my mind. Yes, I'm talking bodies, like thoughts, like the one caught by a phone call. Sometimes I want to be honest. They don't want me to feel. I know that it's a burden since I know what a hold is. I just want to have a scream be heard as a cry sometimes too. And uh, last one, neighborhood seance. My friends were fistfights. We broke each other down to withstand what was ahead. We ate and spat prophecies, misinterpreted as code switching, ciphered with streetlight hymns, an instrumental neighborhood watch. Boys playing monitor the cars. It's fun to figure out if your block is being circled. A seance built my home, so we protect it. Graffiti names form pentacles, bonded through ritualistic joy, woven through fear. We stand here, roll the dice, say each homie's name twice, hoping no other noise circles back around. Thank you. Let me stop this. Thank you so much. Um, our next reader is going to be Jesse Nathan. Uh, Jesse Nathan's poems appear in the Paris Review, Kenyon Review, The Nation, Fence, The Yale Review, Harvard Review, and American Poetry Review. His translations of Alfonsina Storni and Brenda Solis Fong appear in Mantis and Poetry International. Nathan was born in Berkeley where he lived until he was 10. He spent the second half of his childhood on a wheat farm in rural Kansas. Nathan moved to San Francisco after college in part to take a position at McSweeney's. And he, this wasn't in his bio, but I am adding it. Um, he currently co-writes the most compelling short conversations with poets um, on McSweeney's. So if you haven't seen it, they're beautiful little um, snippets from, from amazing poets. Uh, his work has been supported by the Andrew Mellon Foundation, the Ashbury Homeschool, Breadloaf, and the Community of Writers. He lives now in Oakland and is a lecturer in the English department at UC Berkeley. Please welcome Jesse Nathan. <laughs> Thank you, Laurie, and um, thanks everybody for being here. Um, and to my wonderful cohort, it was, um, I'm gonna actually take this off. Um, it was really a special year. Um, I was thinking about how when I applied for this back about a year ago this time or a little earlier, um, things looked very different. Um, so it's been a year of change um, and it's just been special to, to gather with you guys and to have that constant and that um, fellowship. Um, so it's meant a lot to me. Um, and, and of course, Lori, for making it all possible. Um, um, I'm gonna read, I just thought I'd read two things that um, just appeared in, um, in magazines in the May issue this month. So that I just got them in the mail. And um, so the first, thank you, the first is um, a, a, a translation um, a version uh, of the Popol Vu um, that I made with Juan Coy Tani and Josue CD. And um, the Popol Vu is uh, w one of the oldest books in the Americas. Um, it comes out of what's today called Guatemala. And um, it uh, was originally oral. It was passed down as a, uh, memorized by, by the, the Quiche people. Um, and uh, eventually, it was written down in hieroglyphics. They used um, a hieroglyphic writing system um, and uh, on paper made out of tree bark. Um, and uh, then when the Spanish conquerors came, um, it was a crisis uh, in the community and um, some of the elders, well, everyone was being uh, made to learn Spanish um, and made to learn the Latin alphabet. Some of the elders in the Quiche community um, decided to write down the Popol Vuh in 
the language of the invader, um, which was really kind of an amazing decision, but they figured that it was a way to preserve um, their stories. Um, and they wrote it down and then they hid the books um, in the villages. Um, and it was not, not for another couple hundred years that a Spanish priest was um, taken into the confidences of the people. They, they trusted him enough to show him these books, um, which were kept in secret. And he was allowed to make a translation um, into Spanish. And so uh, that was in the 18th century. Um, then they took the book back from him and it's never been seen since. Um, so it's quite probably still hidden in the highlands of Guatemala. So we have the Spanish version and out of that were made various other versions in many other languages. Um, and so there are many out there. Um, my uh, brother-in-law and my nephew, uh, Juan and Josue, are, um, are, are Kekchi Mayan. And um, so we have been talking about the Popol Vuh for many years and um, began to translate some of it over the past year. Um, so this is a, an excerpt from the very beginning of the book, um, the opening lines, just to give you a taste. And it appears in the May issue of Poetry Magazine. And here, in this root place we call Quiche, we're going to write down the words. We're going to write down the ancient words, which are the source of everything, here in this root place called Quiche. And going to teach, tell, show how the world was made, how light was brought by the maker, the shaper, the sustainer, the origin, whose name is Hunampu Possum, Hunampu Coyote, great white peccary, wide-eyed coati, lofty feathered snake, heart of the lake, heart of the sea, great potter of plate and bowl, and also called midwife, matchmaker, gatherer, named Shi Yapak, Shi Mukane, guardian, sponsor, two times a midwife, two times a matchmaker, all told as the story is told in Quiche. They made everything thought of everything, and they did it with the clarity of their being, with the clarity of their words. And we're going to write about this now, even as Christianity spreads around us, even as they talk about the one God. We're going to write these words down now, because there's no longer anywhere to find them. No popol vu, no place to see the light beyond the sea, the story of our lives in the place of shadows, the story of the beginning of things here. And we're going to write this down from the original book because those who would teach it have hidden themselves. It will take a long time, a long writing to adequately relate how the sky was lit and the earth covered to relate the fourfold cornering, measuring, staking, halving the cord, stretching the cord across the sky, across the earth, from corner to corner, says the ancient book, by the maker, the shaper, the parent of existence, laborer, provider of breath, of blood, sustainer, nurturer in the light, bringer of the light, worrier, knowing custodian, Anywhere there are skies, anywhere there are earthly lakes and seas. Thank you. And I'll just read one short poem um, that is in the current issue of the Kenyan Review, and it's about a, a well uh, on the farm that I spent a good part of my childhood on, um, which was a very mysterious thing to me that we had this well, and the water was so delicious um, that came up out of the, the earth. Um, so this um, conjures a, an image of a, a little boy looking down that well, um, imagining the life and the, the layers. It's called the well. What wasn't hidden wasn't plainly there. Year by year, I tracked our well's steel-capped PVC pipe headpost, leaning vaguely as it disappeared in cedar shrub, growing palisade, evergreen and tight. I like to crawl back and stare into the source, rampant for cool air, ushering up, signal 
of elsewhere. It was an elsewhere, under three feet soil, ground up by glacier, laid over clay 14 times thicker, world-making drabs stacked on 20 feet sand, loam, lost downs. Next, a lake in shale. No eye sees it, shifty slab in its bed, and trilobites pressed in their portraits of absence. I'd pry up that flap and disinter cobwebs. I'd pry up that flap, startle the ages with a blast of my flashlight's skittering light. Didn't know then I was looking into the past, alive in must and crushed in layers. A spider's twitch, easy to see from her stance. She understands chance. Inhale that dank, sweet expanse. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jesse. Um, and thank you for bringing those words forward. Uh, it feels remarkable to hear those now and in this uh, present space and time. Um, OK, our next poet is Giselle Medina. Yeah. Woo <laughs> Giselle's identity consists of multitudes, a Latinx queer non-binary from Los Angeles. They are a poet, visual artist, and journalist about to begin their first year as a graduate student at UC Berkeley's Graduate School of Journalism. In Medina's scholarship, they work to contribute in elevating diverse communities through instigating and accurately reporting on, excuse me, on investigating and accurately reporting on deep-rooted issues such as unequal access to mental health resources and racial inequality. In their poetry, Medina writes fiercely about their restless past and our collective world in hopes to inspire and transcend anyone eager to listen. Medina inspires to be an aspires to be an investigative reporter for the LA Times, a multi-published poet, and founder of a nonprofit organization for mental health. This is only the beginning of their journey. Absolutely. Please welcome Giselle Medina. Oh my gosh. Thank you so much, Lori, for uh, reading that. And thank you so much for everyone for being here. Thank you to my lovely fellows. Um, I'm so inspired by you guys every time we meet. And I'm excited to continue um, being around, like, <laughs> supporting you guys in your journeys. Um, I'm also really grateful for reading here at Mod 5, actually. Um, I, four years ago, I was thinking about going to either UCLA or UC Berkeley. Uh, UCLA, because I have family there, and UC Berkeley, because, well, everyone told me to come. Um, and I didn't know what I wanted to do, but uh, long story short, I went to an info session for the English program, and I fell asleep, and I think that was my moment where I was like, well, I probably shouldn't be here. And um, I stumbled upon a poetry reading here at Mod 5, and I was like, wow, these poets that are graduating, so inspiring. I was in tears, and I was like, I really want to write like them. And here I am, and it's such a full circle moment for me. So thank you again for everyone for being here. <laughs> um, in terms of what I'm reading today, um, our theme for the cohort was um, coexistence. And while I don't really know what coexistence means, only because like my childhood didn't have that. And so my poetry is kind of going against the theme, and I've discovered that poetry is actually an act of triumph to create yourself out of nothing. And this is my attempt of doing so. My first poem is called Lost in Translation. I was born among promised land, thrown toward optimistic opportunity, secure shoveled life for myself. Name borrowed after powerful women cannot escape the expectation. Forced to, make, to, forced to smile to make others feel comfortable. Sit up straight, legs crossed, to mask my boyish talent. Fully chew like a carnivore, hunter of prey. Ethnicity borrowed from my ancestors. Cannot escape expectations. Composition of European and indigenous American, or mestizo for short. My blood does not embody me. Tainted with gentrification, bleached, stained, whitewashed skin, paper thin, bare bone body, mommies disappointed of my Spanish because I translate 
very different. Es difícil identificarme como latino cuando será como si estuviera tratando tan duro de pronunciar mi propio idioma. Mommy sacrificed her heart to get me here. Vanished a city called home, cleaned houses owned by television perfect families, nurtured children that she wished was her own. She would remind me with the belt, a whistle in the wind, howl with gnashed teeth, hopeful for the sting. Thank you. Um, my next poem is untitled. I remember my excitement on being invited to a celebration. Denim clad, worn in cowboy boots, tequila shots filled to the brim. I wasn't thrilled about the high school theme turned college senior, rather the excitement surrounding your honeyed eyes. You welcomed me into your space as an early guest. I entertained you through silly party antics, furniture arrangements, supply runs. The night became blurred, drank until the stars swirled around me, took on responsibility for others' inability to compose themselves. I cried in between trying to calm strangers thrashing. You called me sweet, our lips brushed against my intentions. Your reaction made that apparent, inhabiting the same communal space where you flourished and I stood silent. <laughs> Thank you. Um, my final poem is called Existence Slash Resistance. I know we exist because I see us working 24 hours a day, selling tamales y elote y raspadas y fruta con tahini chamoy on the streets of West Oakland. My mother worked under the table for 63 years, picked tomatoes in 100 degree heat and squeezed the rotten ones to cool off with, cleaned mansion-sized homes in Los Angeles with a dirty rag and some soap, rocked abandoned children to sleep with Mexican folktales, buenas noches, mami. I can hear the children's murmurs when people take one look at me and can't believe that I'm Hispanic. Physically, I'm a mixture of sugar and lime. The rest of the recipe depends on if I'm baked well enough. A pinch of confetti sprinkles follow the swirl of the white frosting, top it off with a candle inflamed, ready to burn out any second. When I am asked if my favorite food is Taco Bell, it makes me want to vomit. I feel my tongue retract into my throat. When I speak, I feel the collision of language. My lips move to form Spanish, but the pronunciation does not translate. Oddly, I've studied language my whole life. Read fairy tales about children born in royalty until the sun rose from its hiding spot. Wrote papers about how America invaded our country and our people died in the trenches. The curriculum, I quickly learned, prioritizes the wrong side of history to offer white people comfortability. I mocked my own resistance. How could I be on, on, on their side if I'm an American now? If my mother worked tirelessly to chase an American dream, to give her children a life filled with opportunity, shouldn't I be grateful? They mispronounced her name on the five o'clock news. The headline, 50,000 wetbacks go back to their country just in time for dinner, flashes on screen. We can't properly defend ourselves in your language. Our segment is for only five minutes. Cut to sports, weather, commercials of the same white men flaunting their muscles about a protein shake in a homoerotic way. The telenovelas begin at 11 p.m. Feature a female drug dealer in Aguas Calientes. She sells drugs to provide for her son. Her handsome ex-husband argues about whether he wants to be an actual father and leave behind his girlfriend and his side chick. The drama is anticipated, celebrated, a genuine form of connection, of entertainment, you are allowed to laugh. Thank you. Wow, thank you, Giselle, amazing. All right, uh, next up is Anastasia Lee. Woohoo! Anastasia is a poet and printmaker from the Lake Chabot area of the East Bay. Her work can be found in Berkeley Poetry Review's Midterm Five, Interlace Interstect, the 2021 Southeast Asian Student Coalition Anthology, and on the walls of her former co-op. She approaches poetry with a Vietnamese linguistic sensibility, but writes in English. She's working on that. You can find her behind the counter at East Wind Books of Berkeley, planning their next open mic. Please welcome Anastasia Lee. Thank you. 
No fewer than seven minutes of poetry, <laughs> hopefully no more than eight. To return a persimmon fanned in sunset in the driveway. This year, I gave up the idea of maps, otherwise known as the net cast over the body of the earth for conquest. In the recent past, when I reenacted exile with my own body, I no longer had access to gut feelings. What I didn't know how to say was a terrible and familiar silence that coated the living room. Every cubic inch was heavy with it. The thing called a language barrier between two people, two generations, two countries, is more likely an encounter with the veil between life and death. Two individuals, a mother and daughter, approach it with some intention of honest communication. One holds the want to be rid of memory, the chronic pain. The other holds the want of any memory that can tell her, this is who you are. Without meaning to, their through line begins to unravel into the space of speechlessness. Two looks, one disheartened, one resigned. They'll try again tomorrow. These days, the seasons slide by as half hauntings. If I lie still, I can hear every vector communicating what my body could not for so long, what has been stuck in my skin, stretching, searching for something that could tell me it is enough to lie still and breathe. The dance of flies on the doorstep, still air a haven for song, the shut door of a bin, the safety of darkness, the warmth of elemental things in their simplest form. Is there freedom in such a place? Breeding grounds for life to happen. Where does life happen? Where is it safe enough? And who does it inconvenience? Or rather, what does it defy? How sprouts challenge the cobwebs on the forest floor. If you found a home in my skin, I'd ask you if you were happy. Everything is illuminated in its dying. Tongue wilts against sour grass, blunt knife on tomato skin, blue flame caressing cast iron, puckering plastic, bleeding cabbage, leaves webbed with oil, freckled with sesame, sweating out, chilies curl toward an open palm. Uh, this poem's after Franny Choi. Um, it remains untitled, which is rare uh, for me. Something incisive would have pincers, smooth joints, hard shell, eyes that bore into you. There would be silence in between the scores, lots of waiting. I would think it enjoys the sun, cold water, tide pools, those sharp bowls for life to happen that hurt human feet. It could be so easy to be swept, the current taking you down, down, but you'd find your way back crawling up the sand banks. This creature's hearing is based in the physical vibration of sound, components like breath, force, speed, intention, bubbles, speech bubbles, a gulp of air for each moment you don't claim letting them rise to be with the rest en masse. How do its lovers approach the pincers? Do the ridges offer a nice place to sleep? What are its mating patterns? Does it sit in the tide pools waiting? Does it roam the seabeds for a moment of dark quiet? Does it walk into the dry sand and scream for someone? I figure it never forgets what it loves. In the tide pools, it sleeps on a bed of shells its lovers grew out of. Sea glass from those who believed in dreams, skipping stones for the next time they meet, by the shore, or never, unless the tide brings them back. What happens if it isn't at the tide pools when they return? Would they see the altar and know more than anything that they were known? But maybe it's harder than that, 
the sunny low tide days of living out a dream come by sparingly, and you never know when that might happen again. A speech bubble nestles itself under a seaweed leaf, glimmering. They press their mouth to it, wish for the thing, and watch it rise to the surface. This is my last poem. Um, it bears the title of my favorite, or it bears my favorite placeholder title, Would You Sit Here With Me and Dine on This Color Fast Town? Um, but I generally, um, I'm saving that one for something else. So, um, <laughs> Hands show us what our wants can be. Gossamer webs, wet branches, river rocks, sunspots, we lather, lacquer, linger. We create ourselves by holding others. My piano teacher warned me of a great man who reached for a sound the body couldn't make, not alone, at least. The pain of limits, of distance, is that it tells you exactly who you are. And as I stand across the room from you, I wrangle my hands into two small pockets because I am selfish, and this sacrifice makes me a martyr to the other idiots who never figured out where to hide their souls. My dad's is somewhere by his kidney. If colonial mirrors were easy to destroy, we would have done it by now. Instead, the distortions make us fools, because if there was something wrong with me, your eyes would have told me by now. Someday we'll worship these ruins. Theologies will be our kindling. Our mistakes will tend to the flames. Thank you. Uh, thank, you. thank you, Anastasia. That was beautiful. Um, our last reader of the night is Maria Kerr. Maria is a Bay Area-based writer educator and artist. Maria's poetry has been nominated for a Pushcart Prize and appears or is forthcoming in multiple journals, including Magma Poetry, Tupelo Quarterly, and an anthology, The Future of Black Afro Afrofuturism, Black Comics, and Superhero Poetry. Much of her artistic work across disciplines is focused on black and brown people reclaiming their birthright to both wonderment and the quotidian. Maria was recently chosen by Jericho Brown as a runner-up in Southern Humanities Review's 2021 Auburn Witness Poetry Prize, and her first chapbook, Matology, will be published with Harper Editions in 2023. Please give it up for Maria. Thank you for coming. Um, and I know we're a horizontal, non-hierarchical group, but I consider Lori to be our great leader. So <laughs> thank you, and thank you all my cohort. <clears throat> um, I'm gonna read three poems. Um, okay, Red. Needing to make clear exactly whose flesh and blood had been bloodlet in the battles of yore, they set out to rewrite Red's history, give Red a new birth story, an immaculate conception into a life so carefree, well housed and fed, that no Red had ever fled. Because Red had become too much, calling such undue attention, at times garish really, with its viscosity and wearying obduracy, all sinew and drip, showy moan, scream, bone and smithereen, screaming louder whenever its brethren stopped breathing. Red jogged and then raced through the quiet neighborhood streets, see how fast Red runs, run, Red, run, but Red wrecks all the fun, ruins the blood sport of bloodshed by night and by day, grandstanding that woe is Red and Red is dead. The gush, leak, flood of red. Its 20 score and more metallic seep and excrete into ocean, cotton field, river. Its claret stain into cement, its discontent and foment, unforgivable. Red seemed dead set on sullying the land with its dye and flush, scarleted dusk. If only red could have simply bred with red instead of the whole country cast in a hoar pink tinct, the fairest dying off, soon to be extinct. Red was remind, demand, menace. Like disease injected, left untreated, all weeping canker, pus-filled tusk, 
septic pustule, bloat and blind, bad blooded. Where were the cleanly veins, dainty capillaries, calming cadences and thumps of that cupid cute organ the size of a closed fist? Where were the good old days of flesh colored band aids? The goddamn red blooded bud light and rocket glared bombs in the air born here, not there, Americans. Red made sure that Sambo stunting and pale fist bumping disappeared in the blink of a bloodshot eye. So they shot on the life of Red's mama, pissed themselves laughing on the death of Red's daddy, black eyed then raped Red's sisters, drop kicked and bashed the brothers, dead, smite, and screw, interbred, blight, and coup. And lastly, they removed red from their flag and flew it anew, magnificently now, just white and blue. Mm. Okay, this is a, a poem that I brought into our last two meetings of the cohort. It's called Bearer of. It is good to be a lumbering bear, knowing that what others consider a lumber is anything but. Sitting on the heft of my haunches under moonlight, swaying as bears are wont to do to the one, two, three waltz of the world, which all can hear, if only crouched closely enough. Holding the beauty of my softest belly, still wet furred from the creek in my gracious killer paws. Don't be a worry bear. The eclipse terrors only those who worship the light. And it is good to be a poo bear, who I've discovered I cannot sleep without, and who I worry about when I go, making sure he is nestled when cold, a pillow at his back mornings the sun comes late or never comes at all. But who am I to presume the wants of those whom I want? Perhaps Pooh might like some honey, a posy of roses, or to run into the woods dancing, pea planting, or taking tea with a donkey, a piglet, or a tiger, naked and unafraid. It is good to rest on the seventh day, or sixth, or second, or even before the first collective inhale of stars, we were just a snarl, a swirl. Before such sad, soft mess of living, before I grew in a woman's belly, although so tangentially, at such a distance, like the snaggly tomcat I feed on the porch but afraid to let inside, whose many lives may well ever last my own. Is it too late to come into my life as an unplowed field? I only ask because my sternum has cracked apart and I must go lay in the sun, gold rush of me. But if I must be plowed in this world that tills our bones, let me be fresh mown grass in the mouth of a brown cow murmuring, oh how sweet, as she approaches her day. Keep adding to the list of words, Spilth, tuft, vetch, for they are good. It is good to not read the news, good to not see the boys falling from the sky, forsaken cries, for how else to go on? Surprises are good, even though the world has made of me an unsurprisable queen. I need a bedtime story, a song. I promise I won't fall asleep, but that perhaps is a lie, but a good one as lies go. How good it is that the backside of my heart remains dark in shade. For the glisten, bare, bright bleed, of, bright bleed of it all, exhausting. But know that exhaustion is good, because someday it will force the fugitive joy to stop its flea, sit down and speak softly. For somewhere there's a body waiting for another body, in its most ferocious love, to lay close and closer still and quiet, next to its own thumping, thumping. And this is my third and last poem. I wrote this for my best friend, Peta. <clears throat> it's entitled, Yesterday Was My Birthday and There Were Candles on My Cake. I told my husband not to worry about candles for the cake. Our local store had run out of them. So how delighted I was to see the package of sparklers on the table. We stuck some in the cake, lit and spun the rest in the house, and I blurred my eyes like when I was a young girl imagining myself in the eye of a flickering, glinted storm. And my husband said, let me take you beneath the starlit sparks. So he grasped the shimmers above our heads and he kissed me and I kissed him. I will not say here how old I am because I'm sad about my age, aging. Our big tabby cat can no longer jump. Long gone are his days of leaping to the high window in the hall where he'd lounge over the sill, keeping sleepy watch on the world below. I am torn between helping him or pretending I didn't see him barely make it onto the bed. I too feel the sky further and further away. 
A former friend let her elderly cat die a slow death, insisting that the most humane thing she could do was let nature run its course, insisting that animals know pain differently than we do. The cat starved to death in the bedroom closet. Early in the day, I drove into town, a need to be out in the blush of the world, and was delayed, as usual, by the mid-afternoon traffic jam of our neighbor's herd of cows crossing the road, so slow, serene. As I waited, my best friend texted me, happy birthday, my love. This is us, forever, with a video of a cow running at full speed down a slight incline toward another cow standing patiently in a green field. As soon as the running cow neared the waiting cow, they assumed a mutual trot and headed together towards a water trough on the other side of a grove of trees. Wait for me in the grassy field at dusk. And I still eat red meat. This morning I woke up ready, whispering to myself, rise and shine, you mad beauty. Made a cup of drip coffee, poured into my favorite mug, and sat outside in a patch of bright sun in the bright cold. My husband came and sat beside me, held my face in both his hands, pressed his lips to my forehead, then said there'd been a fire at the neighbor's farm during the night, such a dry winter, and the hay caught on fire. All the cows died, burned to death in the barn. I have not stopped weeping. I am weeping as I write. Thank you. Wow, thank you all so much. Um, I'm, I'm guessing you can see right now how these eight different voices wove a new kind of DNA um, and supported and created space for each other. Uh, I, I've got chills right now. Um, I know we are close on time, but I would like to invite all the poets up real quick. Um, <laughs> round of applause. And I just, I personally just wanted to end um, with, with a question that I'm going to uh, put, put out to all of you, um, which is just a, a general one. Uh, and I think maybe Chai asked it last time, but we were at the halfway mark when you all had your last reading. Uh, and I think about where you were at that point in December and where you are now. And I'm just wondering if, if any of you can just speak to what you've gotten out of this year or the ways you've grown or maybe a particular risk that you felt comfortable to be able to take within this community or maybe even just address kind of the community that has been created here um, and what you're leaving with. Anybody wanna, wanna start? Take a stab at that. I can talk about the, I can talk about the term coexistence. Please do, um, because I love actually yeah. the fact that quite a few of you pushed against it because that is yeah. the thing about a theme. So yeah. please go. I think uh, I came into this thinking that I wanted to be radical about my, uh, my poetry work. And so I thought about critique as like needing to aim my critique at systems. And I actually found that critique should not be a solo process. And there were other people that were in the room, not just willing to critique themselves, but to, to strengthen my critique, which I thought I needed to do alone. So I kind of found a community willing to ask the hard questions, to be vulnerable, to ask the questions differently, to really explore these questions that we have through the poetic form. And so critique doesn't have to be uh, something you do alone. Um, if you can be vulnerable in a room, you can get the most out of it, especially with other folks like this. Beautiful, thank you. Thank you, thank you. I'll say something, um, and I feel like I've said this every time I talk about this cohort, but um, this is the first time I've been with people of color in a poetry group. Um, all of my poetry groups have been all white, and so even in applying for this, it was a huge um, desire to be in a room with other people um, who get it in different ways. Um, so it's really been a gift to be not only with a group of racialized people, but also such different voices. As you heard, we all have very unique entrances into um, sort of telling our experiences. And I've been really honored to just be able to listen and see other people's growth and just see how other people enter into um, language. I'll, I'll say to, to answer your first question about like what I got from the, the fellowship um, and just like, having the structure to meet with you all like every other week. 
Uh, I mean, and I said this in my application is like, I feel guilty about like dedicating time to poetry when like LinkedIn exists and I get like LinkedIn push notifications <laughs> um, because I feel like the guilt that I should be like doing a course or like learning a, a like hard skill um, versus like spending time thinking about the world and like a topic like coexistence. Um, yeah, so I got time. Anyone else want to jump in? I was going to say just to talk about long form versus short form. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Huge growth. <laughs> um, I started going to acupuncture uh, during this fellowship. And um, the best way to describe it is like a very specific um, kind of safety um, and prior to that I felt like my poetry was very restrained out of safety um, out of comfort and um, I ended up reading like two very long pieces which would have never happened back in August um, I, th I leave this fellowship more assured Um, I can go. Uh, this was a big risk for me. Um, I've never had a poetry group, never thought about, well, I did want to think about poetry as like a career, but I'm like, well, the world doesn't care about art as much as we should, you know what I mean? And so um, to apply knowing that like it's a people of color space, but also like people who are coming from a range of backgrounds, but also like these are the most incredible poets I know. And it, it was just so scary to be a part of this the entire year. I've always felt like I just wasn't good enough to be here, but they all made me feel like I am. And so I've taken a lot of risks to just write and to perform and for you guys to be here. So thank you. Thanks, Giselle. Jesse or Lindsay, want to add in anything? want to leave space for you. <laughs> <laughs> after you. No, after you. You said it so well. Uh, yeah, you guys. Time. Yeah. Fellowship. Okay. <laughs> it's been covered. <laughs> oh, I'm afraid of speaking. I spent all day reading about uh, violent peasant revolu revolutions and it's, um, it's <laughs> Sorry, oh, to, to talk, talk into the yeah, mic. Yeah, oh, Right. See, this is me getting immersed in the historical process. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, I think that I can only echo what um, everyone else has said, that it's just been um, a gift of time. You know, yeah, I mean, that again, it just seems like, it seems like such a small thing, right? But it's kind of everything. The gift of time and space to be able to do your work. And again, it is... Somehow the arts oftentimes are undervalued and the space to leap and the space to fail and the space to come back three times, same poem, and go, wait, wait what? Is this, am I getting closer? Um, and to be able to embrace that process um, has been such a gift to be able to watch for you all. Um, I just want to open it up just to see really quickly, does anybody have a question for any of these poets? Yeah, um, and she has a, a mic if you want to. Um, everyone was talking about like having that time to think and like think about insights about the world that you otherwise would be too busy on LinkedIn or whatever to get the chance to like think critically. I just, I don't know why I thought of this question, but have you, any of you had like a funny thought that you've had while having the, that time and space because I know when I have that time and space to think, I'll have like funny thoughts about the world or like just insights that no like no one recognizes, and you you're clearly right about it. Like you you connect things that no one sees are the same. But uh, do do you have anything like that? 
I'm funny, you know? <laughs> okay, like, like, like interesting. Like, um, sorry. Like, I, I don't know. Like Whatever it means to you. Crises? It or can be, yeah. Like, like, okay. I've, like, just from personal experience, like, it's been, like, something that induces a panic attack or something that makes me giggle because it's like, why is that? I don't know. It's okay. If I know how to answer that one. <laughs> um, so I, I came in, like, very seriously against white supremacy. And the funniest thing that I found is that white, whiteness and white supremacy is actually really funny. And what I mean by that is it's absolute bullshit, but it prostrates otherwise. And so the funniest thing is just to be able to like st start a poem and just say how I feel instead of feeling like I have to speak back to whiteness the way it expects me to, which is to take it serious. I don't take whiteness serious. And so I got to laugh about it. I got to be silly. And part of realizing this was just my approach changed to where I just started saying how I felt. And it was still poetry. And it was still critique. And it was still what I wanted to do with my words. But it started from realizing, like, I don't have to be serious. This is not a serious thing. Like, because I shouldn't be, like, beholden to it. And it's it's way that it, that it tells me I need to interact with it. So it, it plays in our face. And I think I want to call that out as such. Yeah. Anyone else? Anything to add? Uh, okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I knew there was. I knew there was some <laughs> boiling there. Yeah, yeah. Um, the the last poem I shared. There's this the last section. I like apologize to Frank Ocean for like missing that he like was talking about his like sexuality and just like changed the gender uh, in his song because like. There's so much else going on in the world. Um, and you know, like when, when you're in the car and you miss your favorite part, like you rewind it to, to get to hear it. Um, yeah, that, just love Frank Ocean. <laughs> so that was, yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Anybody else have any questions? Yeah. How would you compare writing by yourself versus writing with the community? Do you feel yourself influencing each other with your work? And um, how does that show up with your final products? Hmm. Nice question. Workshopping is everything. I think that you can't workshop by yourself. You can edit by yourself, but you can't workshop. And so you can't put your work out there and not in a final form and have it truly be seen by other people and then you know messed with and played with without a workshop type of setting. Like I can do only so much as a small individual, like um, like editor to my own work when I'm by myself. So just being in the space, being able to try things and being able to get honest feedback, it's um, yeah, it's there's nothing like it. So the workshopping is something that I could never do alone. Collaborative making requires for at least me in my life to remain very porous and soft um, because otherwise I walk around the world um, with my jackets with shoulder pads like a porcupine and um, try really, really hard to um, stifle a lot of my fear. Um, I was speaking to Vivi Francis during our craft talk, and I think she frankly marveled at the fact of like how s safe I felt um, in workshop. And that's all, that always remains true. It's always good when you're like well fed and like um, have a very specific like purpose in being in a space. Um, I think, but also like when you're alone and writing alone. Um, I think it's also a different kind of um, responsiveness because I think you're listening for different things. Um, but I don't actually know how to explain that right now, so I'm going to stop. I 
think there's a lot of self-doubt in creating art. Um, so when you're alone and you're, I'm like writing or something, I have that self-doubt all the time. But to have a workshop, to have people to be like, actually, it's not shit. It's actually pretty good. But you should, you know, think about it in this way or change an editing thing or whatever. Um, it's just really helpful. And your world, as big as it is, it's also small. And to have different perspectives to help you extend your world is amazing. And so I think it's so much better to have that confidence in yourself and share your work with others. Anyone else? Um, well, I might have us end there. I know we are over time. Um, but what I would love to do is have you all give a massive round of applause for these writers. <laughs> Again, Damani Thomas. Jesse Nathan, Lin <laughs> sorry, Lindsay Choi, Maria Kerr, Vincente Perez, Anastasia Lee, Giselle Medina, and in the Middle East, Ahmad Diab. Um, thank you so much for coming out tonight, and, uh, and I hope to see you next year. Take care. <laughs> <laughs>